Hello, everyone. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us again virtually. Um, my name is Elizabeth, and I am the project officer at the Network of European Museum Organizations. And today it is once again my pleasure to welcome you to our afternoon session of our European Museums Conference, Museums Making Sense. Before we begin with our uh, prepared Wednesday afternoon session, I would like to review a few of the technical expectations for the session. Your cameras will be off, but you will be able to see our speaker. If you have questions throughout, please feel free to submit them in the chat. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. If you have technical or organizational questions, please write a message to office at nemo.org. If you can't hear us or if you're having issues connecting, we of course always recommend to check your settings or close Zoom and try to rejoin. So today, um, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing a webinar on a topic that uh, I am very passionate about and that of course is very important to Nemo as well, sustainability. Uh, we are turning to an expert on the matter, Caitlin Southwick of Key Culture, who today will be discussing with us how we can make our museums more sustainable. So without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to Caitlin to get us started. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and thank you, everyone. Hello, welcome, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Caitlin Southwick, and I am the founder and executive director of Key Culture. And as Elizabeth said, I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about sustainability. So um, I am going to share my screen. I hope everyone can see. It's a gorgeous sunny day in Amsterdam, a rare one. So if uh, <laughs> blinding light comes in, apologize for that, but we're enjoying that. Uh, right, so we'll start sharing now. Always learning these technical things. Brilliant, welcome. All right, so as Elizabeth said, uh, today we're gonna be talking about sustainability. Um, basically, sustainability is something that I think a lot of people hear the word, but we're not quite sure what it means. So what I really wanna do today is try and kind of break down a little bit of those barriers between this intangible concept of sustainability and start thinking about what sustainability actually means to us as museum professionals and how we can start practicing towards making a more sustainable future together. So sustainability right now it tends to be this bubble within a bubble within a bubble. Um, you know, we're a small sector, if we're being honest, I think we're big, but in the grand scheme of the world, you know, we have cultural heritage, we have museums, and then we have sustainability, which is kind of this, this niche topic within a niche topic within a niche topic. And so it tends to be something that doesn't get as much attention or focus as maybe we would like it to. But today we're going to work on popping this bubble and figuring out what sustainability means to us and how we can actually start taking some action. So what is sustainability? Well, when we start talking about sustainability, we may have several different kind of concepts in mind. Um, a lot of people think sustainability is making positive change. It's maybe being environmentally responsible. Maybe it means being socially responsible. A lot of people tend to think that sustainability is something that's important for the future. But what we really need to start thinking about is the fact that sustainability is not this intangible topic floating in the cloud. It's something that is accessible to us today. And it's not something for the future, it's something for now. So sustainability in its current use was first quoted in the Club of Rome in 1972 as a state of global equilibrium. Later in the Brundtland Report, it was described as something that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. My personal favorite definition of sustainability is something that really rang true to me and actually started launching me on this entire journey of why we as cultural heritage professionals need to be sustainable. Because sustainability at the heart of it is doing good without doing harm. Now, this is something that Henry McGee told me once and it just resonated so deeply because my background is actually in art conservation. So I am a trained stone conservator. I have my doctorate from the University of Amsterdam. But when I was practicing conservation, I felt obviously I'm doing something good, but the way that I was doing it was causing harm to the planet. And this didn't seem to make sense to me. 
So when Henry was telling me about this concept of doing good without doing harm, that really resonated because obviously what we do in our jobs is incredibly important work. And it actually is outlined in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which we're gonna delve into in a minute. But the really important thing that we can think about is not just what we're doing, but in the way that we're doing it to make sure that we're doing things that actually are not just promoting good, but doing it in a way that actually can be beneficial for our planet and for our society. So I'm not gonna get into all of the details about sustainability, but this is just a general overview of kind of where we're at when we mention this word. The current status, the current definition of sustainability is really rooted in the 2015 Agenda 2030. I'm sure most of you have heard of the Paris Agreement. It was signed at the same time, but Agenda 2030 is a broader scope and it's a way to contextualize sustainability that goes through the five Ps, which are people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnerships. And you'll see down here that these are all interconnected. And we're gonna go through a little bit today and figure out what this means for us and how we can help support Agenda 2030 and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So I'm sure most of you have heard of the SDGs. Um, they are the blueprint for the future. This is really the targets and ways that we can actually start being more sustainable and what we're trying to achieve in order to have a sustainable planet and society. Now, I am a huge proponent of the SDGs. I love the way that they really show the interconnectivity of all of these elements of sustainability from social to environmental, obviously economical as well, from development to reuse. It's, it's a really great way to kind of frame what we mean when we're talking about sustainability. The only issue I've had with the SDGs is that they were really written for policymakers. So when you start looking at the targets, I mean, number one is no poverty. And you start looking at the targets and you think, well, this doesn't really apply to me and my work. So what we want to do today is figure is deconstruct the SDGs and actually figure out a way that they can relate to us. Because while there are certain SDGs that specifically discuss cultural heritage or sustainable tourism, every single one of these sustainable development goals relates to us and our everyday work. I think that one of the things that has prohibited sustainability from really being a mainstream talk topic within our sector is this concept of intangibility. It's a little inaccessible. It, once again, is stuck in this bubble within a bubble within a bubble. Um, we're all obviously amazing people who do amazing work and want to do it in a way that is sustainable. But there's a lot of things that have held us up from acting more sustainably. The three that I've really identified are a lack of time, a lack of expertise, and a lack of resources. So at Key Culture, that's something that we're really focusing on. Um, and I'll talk to you guys a little bit more later about what we're doing at Key Culture. But I think that we all have the intention to be more sustainable if we just knew what to do or how to do it. So we're gonna go through some really practical ways that we can start applying sustainability in our daily lives. One of the important things, of course, that we keep in mind throughout the course of the next 40 minutes or so is that everything is interconnected. I already talked about how sustainability and the SDGs really lay out the framework for that interconnectivity, but we can really start seeing that, especially this year, in a way that we've never been able to see it before. I mean, we can't talk about the COVID-19 pandemic without talking about loss of biodiversity. We can't talk about social injustice without talking about burning of the Amazon. We can't talk about Black Lives Matter without talking about pollution. So it's a really interesting way because more prevalently than ever before, we are really seeing this cause and effect cycle. So we need to take a step back because I think the important thing is that we need to figure out what questions we're gonna be asking. And some of the questions that I think are really important for us in our daily practice is to be asking, what are we doing? Who are we doing it for? And how are we doing it? Of course, the number one question, and this is something that Al Gore says in his, um, in his climate reality project presentations, is do we need to change? I think that most of us realize that we do need to change. So then the next question of course becomes, how do we change? Sustainability, to date, of course, as I've already mentioned, is something that has kind of seemed a little bit outside the realm of the museum world. 
um, you know, when you go into a museum, you don't start thinking about, oh, gee, I wonder what the carbon footprint of this museum is. But we as museum practitioners all understand the incredibly intensive energy consumption of our buildings. Of course, this is to maintain our collections. So this is one way that we can already start making connections. Another thing that has been a very hot topic lately and something that needs to be addressed even more is this idea of decolonization. So we're going to talk about how some of these concepts within our daily work are directly relatable to the entire sector of sustainability. But it's not just about understanding how it applies to our sector, but also how it applies to us. And making a personal connection with sustainability, finding something that you care about, that turns talk into action. That's how we can make it accessible and practical. So what we're going to do today is look a little bit at the various concepts and various aspects and then see how we can turn our desires into practical actions. Now, we've all seen the effects of climate change and what's happening to our cultural heritage from coastal erosion to flooding all over Europe. This is a very uh, tangible way that we can see how climate change is directly affecting our jobs and our lives as cultural heritage professionals. But I think one thing that we're not focusing on is really how we're contributing to the problem. Now, there has not been a lot of benchmarking done for the energy cons consumption of museums because we're a small sector and because we're doing good, so we can kind of negate the harm. But we have to stop thinking like that because our job as cultural leaders is not just to start talking about sustainable issues, but is to also start practicing what we preach. And it's so important that we take a look at the way that we're conducting our day-to-day -day business in order to find out how we can actually start being more sustainable and demonstrating that it's possible to do this. The, um, as I said, there is not a lot of benchmarking that's been done in terms of carbon footprint of museums, but there is um, some research that comes out of the United States. A woman by the name of Joyce Lee has been doing some incredible work, and she found that in the United States, museums alone, so not including storage, not including personnel or art transportation, produce 12 million metric tons of carbon emissions every year. That is the equivalent of all of the cars in the city of London. So all of that smog in London is what's being produced by the museums in the United States alone. So maybe we actually have a little bit bigger footprint than we think we do. The other thing that's of course we've already touched on and we'll be talking about more and more today is this idea of decolonization and social sustainability. Now at the heart of our jobs and at the heart of our institutions is this social aspect. You know, we're there to serve our communities. So the question now, of course, is that how are we doing that? How does the way that we present history affect society today and affect future societies? I think that a lot of people kind of shy away from these topics of decolonization and repatriation, structural racism, because they're really difficult topics. But it's really time for us to stop hiding and start asking the tough questions. So what do we do about this? Well, we're gonna go through some practical things, but I think that just to kind of get a context of what we're gonna be thinking about, it's really about asking these questions. So what are we practicing? What are we preaching? And how are we doing what we do? So we're gonna go through and analyze a few of these things now. I already introduced the United Nations SDGs and I talked a little bit about how they're really specifically for policymakers. So now what I want to do over the course of the next few slides is break these down and translate them for us as cultural heritage professionals. Now, the good life goals are basically a translation of the SDGs for everyday people. And this had me really inspired when I heard about this because of course, as an everyday person, even in my personal life, I can look at the SDGs and think that's great, but I'm still not quite sure how I'm supposed to eradicate poverty in all of its forms in the entire world. Um, you know, do I donate? Do I, <laughs> what does that look like? So the good life goals were actually created as a, basically a footprint for individual people and how they can start supporting the SDGs. So inspired by this, I decided that we were going to go ahead and make a version of this for cultural heritage professionals. 
So what we did, and this has been a joint effort over the past couple of years, is we've looked into the targets of the actual United Nations SDGs and took out what the various um, tar specific targets are that are really related to us as cultural heritage professionals. We also looked to the Good Life Goals to see what recommendations they had for upholding the SDGs. We mixed these all together, added a little bit of museum jargon in there, and came up with the Cultural Heritage SDGs. So the Cultural Heritage SDGs are going to have a soft launch in January of next year. And then we're going to spend next year inviting everyone to co-create the targets and goals for this particular resource. And then our hope is that we can launch these along with COP next year in order to have a sector-wide consensus on how we, as cultural heritage professionals, can start supporting and helping to achieve the SDGs. But what I'd like to do today is go through some of the um, SDGs for cultural heritage professionals so that we can really start to get a concrete ideas of what we can do in our daily professions to be more sustainable. So as I said, this is how the um, cultural heritage SDGs are going to work. Their really idea is to make these um, an accessible tool for cultural heritage professionals like you and me. So the first one we're going to start off with is education. Now, there are a bunch of different targets for each of these, but I'm going to pick out a couple that we can de delve a little bit more deeply into. One of the really exciting things about Bengal heritage professionals is that every single thing we do can help support the SDGs. And this, of course, starts with our education and outreach programs. It's so easy for us to support any one of the 17 SDGs by developing educational programs or exhibitions about the topic. So this is something that is really a, an easy win. And it's something that is incredibly important because if we can start educating our visitors about the SDGs, that can create the empathy and the cultural connection needed to get not only our institutions practicing more sustainability, but our communities and the general public. Another couple of things that's really important to think about in terms of, in terms of education is that it's not just outward facing. It's also important to start thinking about opportunities within our own careers and our jobs. So when we're talking about in our jobs, we're talking a little bit about what we do and why we do it. And this of course relates to education. It also relates to inclusion. So how are we relating our collections? Do we know about our collections? Are we educating ourselves about where our collections came from? And are we communicating that to our audiences? This is the heart of decolonization. The other part that it's really important to think about is that words matter. And I know that you can see this um, big words matter book. This is uh, something written by the Tropen Museum here in Amsterdam. It's a really, really great resource. But this is a way that we can start thinking about sustainability in terms of the social aspects and especially accessibility and inclusion and equality. So how we communicate with each other and how we communicate with our public which is, this is one of the education aspects, of course, but this is also just looking internally at our own jobs and how we talk to our colleagues and how we talk to our audiences. So just educating ourselves about our collections, educating ourselves about how we are communicating our collections, and then educating ourselves about our audiences. Obviously activities and work, this is a really great one because this is related exactly to everything that we actually do. So some of the really easy ways for us to start incorporating sustainability into our activities and our work is to start asking questions about the tough issues. So policies regarding repatriation and decolonization. Um, another one that's really important is considering accession and deaccession strategies for sustainable growth of collections. I think that one of the things that's really important for us to realize in our capacities as museum professionals is that we actually have a lot more power than we think. I was doing a um, social sustainability uh, uh, professional development course, and one of my uh, participants said, you know, Caitlin, this, this all sounds great, but I'm a conservator, so I don't really have the capacity to talk about decolonization. Like, that's not my job. That's the curator's job, right? And I disagree with that. I think that is everyone's job, and especially us as conservators, especially curators, especially registrars, every single person has the responsibility to ask the questions about where are our collections coming from? How are we portraying our collections? 
are we talking about, are we portraying all points of view of history? So we're going to talk a little bit more about decolonization because that's also something that I think is really important to touch upon in terms of understanding how we can influence that in our own jobs. Um, before we go on to that, though, I do want to just touch on number six, which is the uh, accession and deaccession strategies. One thing that I think is incredibly important for us to think about is this mentality that, you know, as museums, we tend to collect things, and this is wonderful, but I think it's really important for us to also start thinking about what we're doing with our collections. Because if we just can continue to accession more and more items, then we have to continue to build larger and larger storage spaces. And the sustainability there, we obviously can see is not, is not a thing. Now, 95% of our collections sit in storage and we'll never see a display. And I think that that's really frustrating for a lot of people because this, this has to do a lot with not only the unsustainability of having to maintain all of those collections in newly built storage facilities with climate condition control and all of these different environmental impacts, but also it's very exclusive behavior. If we're looking at, you know, there's only 5% of our collection on display, then we're, we're taking away the interaction of 95% of our collections from our visitors. So how can we start thinking about the way that we are showing our collections as well as the way that we're collecting in order to be more inclusive and more accessible? So we're gonna go back to this decolonization conversation. Um, I was speaking with a colleague of mine uh, in Hungary and she was saying, well, you know, a lot of museums here might not think about decolonization because we were not a colonizing country, so it doesn't apply to us. And this is why decolonization might be a little bit of a misnomer. Decolonization is not just about a colony colonizer relationship. It's actually just about being open, transparent, and making sure that you're portraying all perspectives of history. So telling all sides of the stories. Um, it's a really interesting concept because, you know, decolonization de can mean different things to different people. And there's different definitions that you can see on here. But I think that at the heart of it, what is being really, what's really important is that history is not told from a single singular perspective. Um, there's a really amazing uh, program in the, United, in the United Kingdom called uh, Decolonizing um, heritage, and I, I'll have to send the link to everyone if they're interested, but basically the idea is that they're working with school children to decolonize historic houses in, in England. And um, one, of the, one of the kids wrote a poem about this whole concept of decolonization, and it simply read, um, it, it simply read that, uh, you know, I am a person, I have a history, he bought my history. And it was really powerful to think about you know, somebody's history is being portrayed by someone else because they were bought as a slave or their history was basically stolen from them. And so the way that the history from that particular story is being told is not from the perspective of everyone, but it's from the perspective of the winner. You know, we all know that, that saying that the winner writes the history, but it's so important for us as museums to combat that, to start thinking about the way that we portray history is not just from a singular perspective. It has to include everyone's perspective. And this is how we combat structural racism. It's by asking the tough questions. Are we portraying history from all perspectives? And that's how we create more inclusion, more understanding of different communities, more understanding of different people and different ethnicities and different cultures so that people can start realizing that, you know, it's not just one way, but there are multiple points of view. And that's how we open up our societies to learn from each other and to start being more accepting of each other as well. And this is the power that we have as museums. And it's absolutely amazing to me how much we can influence our society through our culture. But this is really a key. And this is something that I've heard not just from people within our sector, but also from scientists. Um, we have a climate scientist on our board who says, Caitlin, this is exactly the way that we need to be teaching people about about issues regarding climate change and um, all of the social injustices, it's through culture because that's how we connect people. So I want everyone to really make sure that they understand 
what kind of an influence and opportunity we have to do this. And this is really at the heart of what we do. And it's amazing to see how many incredible stories there are already about museums doing such great work with this. So I'm very inspired by everything that's being done and looking forward to continuing this journey. Another tough topic, of course, is repatriation. And I think that what's really important to think about when we talk about repatriation is that it's not up to necessarily us to decide who what is being repatriated, but it's very important to understand that repatriation is a dialogue and that it's about listening. And I had a conversation with an indigenous uh, woman in uh, British Columbia a couple of months ago. And she said to me, she said, you settlers need to stop trying to control everything. And that really shut me up. <laughs> and I said, I'm here to listen. Tell me, you know, what, what do I need to, what do I need to hear? And she was saying, you know, if you're going to be start, starting to talk about repatriation, you don't tell us how to do repatriation. We tell you how to do repatriation. We talk about this. We have a dialogue about this. And I think that a lot of people feel that these conversations are really difficult to start because you know, we don't want to offend anyone. We don't want to say the wrong thing. We don't want to um, put ourselves in a position where it's uncomfortable. But if we can just open up the conversation and just start by asking a question, you know, it's okay not to know all of the answers. It's okay to think, I don't know anything about decolonization. I don't know anything about repatriation, but that sounds like something we should be doing. The first thing is just ask a question. Just say, I don't know anything about it, but I want to learn. I, you know, can you tell me what, what the best way to start this talk is? And then that's how we create dialogue and that's how we find resolutions. Um, this is the Indigenous Repatriation Handbook. It was written by Nika Collison, who's um, the executive director at the Haida Gwaii Museum in British Columbia. And it's a phenomenal resource for understanding what repatriation is and how to conduct it properly. Uh, I have a quick story that I, I wanted to share about repatriation gone wrong. Um, there was a museum in the UK that had a collection from Peru and they thought, okay, we're gonna repatriate this. So they sent it back to the Peruvian government and the Peruvian government looked at this and said, we don't want these things. And they sent them back to the UK. And then it was this whole backing and forth thing of we don't want this and we don't want this. And there was no dialogue there before, but of course, the museum thought that they were doing the right thing by sending it back to the rightful owners, but the Peruvian government didn't want it. And so then there was this whole issue of who does it belong to and where does it go now? So once again, it's about starting with asking questions and then finding a conversation. Um, there are also really great stories. I had another a colleague of mine um, tell me a story about a book that they had in their collection that was from um, an Israeli community. And they contacted the community and said, you know, we have this book, do you guys want it back? And the community said, you know what, you're taking really good care of it and we actually really appreciate that. Um, so hold on to it, but we would love access to it. And so what they did is they digitized the whole thing so that the community could have access to it when they wanted and then the museum could continue to take good care of it. So it was a win-win situation and everyone was happy, but it's just about opening up these dialogues and having these conversations. So number 10 is inclusion. And we've already touched a little bit about, on a little bit about this. You're starting to see the interconnectivity here, I can tell. Um, so it's really important that we continue to see this. So inclusion is not just about are you know the way that we treat each other as human beings although obviously that's the most important part but it's also about being inclusive in our in our jobs so as cultural heritage professionals um, and also with our audiences and we talked a little bit about accessibility as well but i think that one of the things that's really um i don't want to say combative but one of the things that is really important for us to think about is you know when we look around at our colleagues in our offices um you know it's we have a certain demographic that we appeal to as cultural heritage professionals we're not super inclusive and there's a few different reasons for this um you know i i come from a conservation background and conservation is not necessarily um something that everybody can do or maybe it is but we have this preconceived notion that it's not 
Um, it's also, there's a lack of job security and cultural heritage. So it's not something that everyone has the luxury to do because maybe they, they can't afford to have that job insecurity. And of course, you know, we don't get, we don't do what we do for the money. I mean, we certainly don't get paid a lot and we're always overworked. And so it's not, it's not available to everyone. And I think that that's something that we really need to start thinking about in terms of being inclusive, not only in the way that we treat our audiences and you know, inviting in um, diverse communities and, and creating more education and outreach for different, uh, for different demographics, but also in, in our jobs, what we're actually doing in terms of, in terms of our, our work. Um, and I think that another thing that's, that's really interesting is, is ways that we can create more partnerships for inclusion. And that of course is also within our own sector. So how can we get museums from other countries, other parts of the world um, to create more dialogue and share and share resources, share knowledge, share information and um, become, become more communicative with, within just our sector on a global scale. So I talked already a little bit about the lack of diversity in the field and the reasons for this. Um, and of course, we can open this up by having more opportunities for job security. This is something I will be talking to the European Commission about, uh, what is it, next week, I think, at the Voices of Culture. Um, so how we can provide more job security that will hopefully open up uh, more opportunities. But also, as we talked about earlier, you know, accessibility to our collections. I have, I do have to say, I mean, I've worked at some of the most incredible uh, institutions and organizations around the world, including the Vatican Museums and the Getty Conservation Institute and the Uffizi Gallery. And, um, you know, I get backstage access to all of these places and it's, there's nothing more, you know, exciting than uh, walking into, you know, the Vatican and opening a rope and going behind the scenes and being like, bye crowds. <laughs> and just being able to have that like exclusive access to these phenomenal artworks that other people don't get to see, but other people don't get to see them. So this is actually being quite exclusive and we have a very exclusive job. As conservators, we're the only ones who are allowed to touch these objects, thank you very much, which I understand there's the preservation aspect to it. And this is, of course, um, you know, part of our jobs is to protect these objects. But this goes back to these questions of what are we doing and who are we doing it for? Are we protecting objects for ourselves? Are we protecting objects for future generations? Are we doing what we're doing for the objects? Or are we doing it for people? So if our objects are sitting in storage facilities their entire lives, because that's in their best preservation, who's actually benefiting from this? So this is also this idea of doing good without doing harm. And this also goes into the exclusivity factor. This goes into the inclusivity factor. This goes into the, why do we do what we do? So our jobs, we'll get into this. Um, and our community, of course, this is this another thing that's going to become even more relevant now. So in the original SDGs, 11.4 literally says, conserve, protect, and house our cultural and natural heritage. So we're good, right? We've, that is literally our job. So that's really wonderful because we don't have to worry about doing any of the other stuff, right? Well, we'll go back to what Henry said and doing good without doing harm. So I suppose we do need to start thinking about that. But the good news is that this is something that is really easy for us to tangibilize and to say like, this is what our jobs are and this is in the SDGs. So it's really wonderful and super important for us to celebrate the successes and to really um, be proud of where we are upholding the SDGs. I think the most um, accessible point of acting sustainably is to recognize where we're already doing it and build on those successes. So I can congratulate every single one of you for fulfilling SDG 11.4 in our jobs. I think that that's incredibly important to be proud of that and to build on that. So how can we do it better? Um, and then of course, community. This is, the, this is the other side of 11. And I think that this is something that's becoming more and more relevant. Um, with travel restrictions, with COVID, with all the uncertainties, we have a new role to play as institutions. We're no longer gonna be hosting, well, I mean, we'll see, but it's kind of my hope that we will no longer be hosting blockbuster touring exhibitions that are just going, you know, from Australia to Dubai, to Paris, to New York, to LA. 
but actually we're going to have to start and we're no longer serving you know the tourists that fly in from all of those places but we're going to start having to rethink our roles here and we're going to start having to reconnect with our local communities so how can we do this and this is really interesting because what is our role within our local community are we listening to our community members are we engaging with their wants and needs so one of, the, one of the ideas on here was opening your space for community gatherings and events. It's really nice to have you know, a safe space for open dialogue, to start listening and creating, and creating a conversation about what local community needs are and how we as the museums can actually start serving those. So of course, other parts about this have to do with outreach and engagement. But I love this. This is a quote from our social sustainability director, Pia Edkvist, and she wrote that museums can create a lasting relationship with the community through dialogue, community building, and collaborative practice. And I think that just hits it na the nail on the head because what we're looking for is, you know, obviously like there's there's the financial component. We are we are businesses, I suppose, but I don't think that's why any of us got into museum studies or cultural heritage. Um, it's not because we wanted to be businessmen and you know all about the bottom line and how many people can we get in the door, but it's because we care about our heritage and we care about people. And we care about making those connections and you know creating those experiences that are really powerful. I mean, I got into conservation because when I was nine years old, I walked into the Louvre for the first time and I saw all of these ancient Greek and Roman statues and I was just absolutely in awe. And I wanted to conserve those so that there was another little girl in a hundred years who could have the same experience. And I think that that's really a powerful message is, you know, why do we do what we do? And, you know, this also of course has to do with how we treat our local communities. Are we just a museum that brings in tourists and has these big blockbuster shows and ignores the neighbor across the street? So this is something that we really need to start thinking about, especially in light of the global pandemic and who our new audiences are gonna be. Because if we have a lot less tourists coming in, we're gonna have to start shifting gears and start thinking about how we can get our neighbors across the street to come in our doors. So. I think it's really an amazing opportunity for us because this is obviously something that I was touting even last year before the pandemic, but now it's more relevant than ever. How can we become relevant to our local communities and how can we best serve their needs? There we go. Okay, so we have just a couple more here and then we're gonna get into some bigger picture questions. Number 12 is consumption and circularity. So this is really about the environmental impact. So I think that it's really quite prevalent for us, especially myself as a conservator. I don't know how many conservators we have here today, but it's really tangible to understand waste. I mean, that's actually how I got into this whole thing. When I was a master's student a million years ago, I was walking by the trash can, looked down, thought it was full of you know, disposable nitrile gloves and thought, well, that's really wasteful. Can't we do something? Waste is a really easy entry point to sustainability in an environmentalist aspect because it's so easy to see you can you know you can see all the all the gloves in the trash you can you know the piles of plastizoder piling up everywhere it's just very easy to understand what the impact is you know we've all seen the plastic soup in the ocean so it's something that's really tangible and one of the really interesting things about what we're doing is that the way that we're currently doing our exhibitions, for example, the way that we're doing packaging and shipping, there are better solutions for it. So I'm really excited to start talking with you guys about what some of those solutions are gonna be. We'll be um, delving into that a little bit more later. Um, but I think two very easy concepts that we can think about um, when we're thinking about wasted materials. And unfortunately, we don't have too much time to dive into these, but I just wanted to go over the five R's which are refuse, reduce, reuse, repurpose, recycle. And just iterate that those need to be done in that order. Recycle is almost a cop out. So don't immediately go to that, but go through the five R's in their hierarchy. If you're using a material. You first ask, do I need to use it? How much do I need to use? Can I reuse it instead of using a new one? Can I repurpose it and find something else I can do with it? And then can I recycle it? 
And then the other thing is a life cycle analysis. And I'm going to give you just the briefest explanation of this, but there's more information if you'd like in the resources at the end. And an LCA is basically a way of examining a material to th think about where it comes from and where it goes. When you pick up a material and you're looking at it, you know, you think about the use of it, but you don't think about, you know, how was this made? What were the raw materials that were used to produce this? What was the you know, carbon footprint of the factory where it was made? How, what is the carbon footprint of the travel it had to get from that factory to here? And then you know, what happens to it after it's done? And I, I put it in the trash can, obviously, bye, it's done. But <laughs> actually what happens to it afterwards? Does it have to be transported somewhere else? What is the process of disposing of it? Is it incinerated? If it does go to a recycling place, is it downcycled instead of upcycled or recycled? Is it something that can produces a lot of uh, carbon emissions by having to process the material and make something new out of it? So a life cycle analysis is basically, you might have also heard of cradle to cradle. Um, it's an analysis of or the impact, the carbon footprint impact of the entire life cycle of something. So not just its use phase, but where does it come from and where does it go? So we can start thinking about that in terms of our material consumption as well. And, um, you know, this just goes into a little bit of showcasing where we're using a lot of materials. Um, this is me <laughs> pouring a very toxic biocide over a stone sculpture. Um, there are better ways to do that, by the way. So that's really exciting. But I think that we all know that there, in, especially in conservation, but also, of course, in, in museums, in our packaging and shipping, there's a lot of material waste that we can start thinking about better ways to, um, to mitigate those issues. Number 13 is climate change. For a lot of people, especially in Europe, this is a really easy entry point for sustainability. When you talk about sustainability, a lot of people immediately go to climate change. We've already talked a little bit about the energy consumption of our institutions. We've talked a lot about our uh, waste and materials and how that impacts the climate. So, and of course, we've already talked about our education and outreach programs. So it's really a wonderful way for us to start thinking about what our impact is and how we can start mitigating it, as well as how we can start educating our public about climate change. Um, I'm not gonna go into too many details because unfortunately we just don't have time, but lighting, HVAC systems, and art transportation are kind of the three biggest uh, issues when it comes to carbon emissions. So we'll talk about some solutions later for solving these, um, but unfortunately we don't have too much time to get into those right now. So the last one I want to talk about before I wrap things up here and ask some open-ended questions for everyone is working together. And this is my personal favorite because when it comes to sustainability, I think the most important thing to realize or to think about is that you're not alone and you don't have to do all of it yourself. Um, partnerships are absolutely essential to everything that we do. I talked in the very beginning about the fact that sustainability, one of the bottlenecks for, for achieving sustainability in our sector is that maybe we don't have the expertise. I don't know about you guys, but I was not trained um, in sustainability when I was an art conservator. That was something I did afterwards. And it's because we haven't quite put those together yet, but we're doing that now. But the great thing is that if we wanna solve a problem, there are people out there who have the expertise. So let's find those partners. Let's find those allies and those supporters to actually start finding solutions that are applicable to us as cultural heritage professionals. And it's so important to understand that, you know, this is a this is a reciprocal relationship. I mean, there are so many ways that we as a network of museums can actually start supporting and promoting sustainability. And there are partners out there who need us. So how can we advocate for those partners as well? And how can they help us to find solutions for ourselves? So this is a really, really powerful thing to do is don't be afraid to ask for help and know that you're not alone in this. And let's find ways that we can support each other and work together to achieve our goals. So I wanted to very quickly touch on COVID. We talked a little bit about um, how COVID's affecting basically what our, what our institutions are dealing with, but this is just also another, another example of the intersectionality of these issues because COVID is disproportionately affecting places with higher pollution and it's disproportionately affecting um, what they call MAPAs or most affected people in places. And basically 
these facts are that, you know, obviously if you live in an area where there's higher pollution levels, you're more susceptible to COVID and you're more, susceptible, you're more likely to die from it. And that's because of course there's more pollution in the air, which causes your respiratory system to be, to be inhibited. So it's really important to us to start looking at the social justice aspects and the environmental justice aspects as one, because they really are. You cannot talk about the burning of the Amazonia without talking about indigenous rights. It's very clearly linked. And as I mentioned before, this is something we're seeing more and more of um, as, as this year progresses. So I just wanted to wrap up with just a couple of key points uh, to summarize some of the some of the ways that we can support sustainability through the through the SDGs. Education and outreach are obviously our biggest strong points. I mean, every single SDG can be supported by our educational programming and our exhibitions. Um, it's so important for us to realize the capacity that we have and the influence that we have on our society and what opportunities we have to really influence and affect that change. Um, also, of course, partnerships are key. As we already talked about, it's not your responsibility alone to solve all of the world's problems, but together we can make a really huge impact. And then, of course, the aspects of environmental sustainability, thinking about the LCAs, thinking about the five R's, thinking about our carbon footprint, and then of course the social aspects of promoting accessibility, inclusion, diversity, equality, and just common human decency in everything that we do. And I don't think that I'm preaching to anyone who needs to hear that, but I'm just saying that I think that we can really celebrate the fact that we do that and we do that well and continue to promote that because that resonates out to our communities and to our societies at large. So I wanted to very quickly give a little um, introduction. I've, we've talked a little bit about um, some of the some of the ways that we can start working together and we're going to be launching key futures in january of next year and um, i'm really excited to be putting this program out for everyone um, it's going to include accreditation and certification for sustainable practices as well as training um, our key books are your how-to step-by-step guides on actions you can do to be more sustainable they are written specifically for cultural heritage professionals by experts in the field in collaboration with cultural heritage professionals. So we've translated all of that jargon into something that's really accessible and easy to follow. So I really hope that those will be helpful for all of you in achieving your sustainability journey. And um, if you'd like more information about Key Futures, please do let me know. We're gonna be doing a big launch of that, as I said, in January. So really looking forward to joining you guys in your sustainability journey and seeing how we can support you together. So um, as I said, lots of resources here. I'm very happy to share the slide with anyone who would like uh, to follow up with some of the things that we've talked about today. And I think I'm a few minutes over already. So I'm gonna wrap up there and thank you so much. And really looking forward to hearing your questions and hopefully uh, answering some of them. So uh, Liz, may you wanna come back on and- Absolutely. Um, yeah, and first, just let me say thank you so much uh, for your wonderful presentation. Um, you know, I, I think there's just there's so much value in your ability to really bring in these these massive, you know, big picture items, but then also bring it down to some really practical steps for us. So thank you so much for that. You know, I'm really glad that you brought in the, the social justice aspect because there, there are such strong connections between social justice, climate, sustainability, and culture. But I feel that too often these are kind of the afterthought when really, you know, that the, these are core things that connect to one another. And yeah, um, yeah and I also, know. You know, I, I, I would say too, throughout the conference, um, there's been a lot of mention of, you know, multi-perspectivity and this transition of purpose from objects to people. And so I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up as well, because I think that's really embedded in our community purpose. And if we are doing things for our community, you know, our actions are going to be required to, you know, have sustainable actions there with them. So... Thank you so much for that. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I could go on, but- <laughs> Yeah, you and I can go on about this for hours, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but I would, yeah, but I would of course like to uh, bring in some questions here from, from the chat. Let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, 
So when we have, uh, I guess we're looking for um, a solution about uh, storage, what we can do with storage. If we have, you know, 95% of items are in storage um, and then, and sometimes we can only display a small amount of them. So um, what, what are some solutions that you would put forward in terms of dealing with that storage issue that you brought up earlier? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, it's a tough one. I mean, it's not like we can snap our fingers and have, you know, larger museums. Um, but I think that there are some ways that we can start thinking about, um, about, about doing this in a more sustainable way. And there's kind of three elements here. Um, one of them is this idea of too large of collections. So maybe what the first step is to start thinking about deaccessioning strategies. And, you know, how do we evaluate what would actually be important for our collections and maybe ways that we can start deaccessioning and you know we can also make some money off of that i actually know in um this is a funny story but i i, I studied in italy for three years and one of the things we have to study there as part of our conservation is the legislation um and they have a little loophole in their system in italy where basically and if i'm if i'm misquoting this, please forgive me, but I just thought this was a really interesting idea. Um, if there's someone who sees an object that they love, they can buy it from the government um, as long as they can prove that they can keep it in better conditions than it's currently in, that they have a conservator who will inspect it once a year, and that once a year they have, they open it up to the public enjoyment. So basically they have to open their house and offer everyone to come in and see it. And it's technically still owned by the state, but the individual person actually has the opportunity to keep it in their house. And I just thought that that was a really out of the box idea. But I think that we need, maybe need some more creative thinking when it comes to what we do with our collections. So I would say the first step to that would be to develop a deaccessioning strategy and start thinking about you know, what, what our values of our collections are and what collections we actually need to be keeping. I think the second part of that is to you know, maybe start thinking about opening up our storage facilities to um, to be more accessible to the public. I know that there are a lot of institutions that do public tours of their storage facilities. I think that's a really great idea to, uh, to um, tackle that accessibility issue. And then of course, the other component of this is the carbon footprint. And if we're constantly building larger and larger facilities with very strict climate conditions, that's a problem. So one of the ways that we can start combating that, actually two things that we can do. One is we can start looking at more sustainable storage facilities. Um, the Danish storage facility uh, solution is a great one. That's uh, completely carbon neutral storage facilities. And I know a few, um, a few companies that actually do that. Um, and then the other one, of course, is to adopt less stringent climate control conditions. So either Viso Green Protocol or ASHRAE, um, CCI, AICCM, and GCI have all put out um, less stringent climate condition uh, regulations as well, um, or to start doing microclimates instead of large scale climate control. So I think just starting to look at from a social perspective and also from an environmental perspective, there are a lot of, a lot of great ways for us to start looking at uh, solutions there. Yeah, that's that's great. I, I mean, um, there's there's such a wide range there, I guess. And I mean, just uh, the the basics of, you know, redesigning your structures and whatnot, um, but then also mentioning these uh, these, you know, new uh, community ownership programs. I mean, that just goes to show that there's there's so many opportunities for creative solutions here yeah. when when we sit down and we think about, you know, these tough problems. So yeah, yeah. thank you. Of course. No. And I just, just to mention that, you know, this is one of the things that I always am such a proponent about is the fact that I think that this is why we can do this is because we have such a, as cultural heritage professionals, we have such a unique perspective on the world. I mean, combining science and history and culture and art and it's just, we are so creative that I think that we can really solve these issues. So yeah. I'm, yeah, I, I, highly encourage all of you to think outside the box and find some solutions and let's do them and let's do them together. Yeah, it's uh, that taking ownership and being creative and collaborative, you know, that's excellent. Um, so let's let's go to another question here. Um, I mean, this is kind of just uh, an asking for a bit more detail really about um, your forthcoming cultural heritage strategic developmental goals and how museums might use them. Um, 
uh, the commenter is saying that uh, I wonder if museums might find the existing SDGs a bit unwieldy as there are so many of them. So um, yeah, if you could say yeah. a few more words about those because I, I also found them to be quite inspired. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that, you know, when it comes to the SDGs, I, I find them also to be a little bit inaccessible sometimes. Um, but I think that what's, what's really, um, the, the purpose of having the, the cultural heritage version of that was that the targets would actually be something that people could feel like, oh, I can actually do that. So as opposed to, you know, eradicating poverty in all of its forms and all of these, all of the po political jargon. Um, if you want to know how to use the SDGs, there's a great book by Henry McGee. Um, it's called Museums and the SDGs. Uh, you can download it from his website, uh, Curating Tomorrow. Um, but and, and he gives a really great, more policy level, uh, larger picture idea of how museums can support the SDGs and how the SDGs need museums in order to be uh, really promoted. And um, I think that the idea behind the cultural heritage goals, so the translation version, is just to make people, basically as people like me, feel like they could actually do something. Um, so, you know, if you wanted to, it, it, it makes them feel like it's actually something that's related to my work. So I, I, I hope that that is a good answer. Um, you know, I, I think that the idea is just that we can all kind of collaborate and put in ideas about, you know, ways that are targets that we as a sector can feel are achievable. So, you know, making sure that all of our storage facilities are open for public or something like that in order to, to, um, to fulfill the inclusion goals. So how do, do we as a sector promote and support the SDGs. And I think that that's kind of the idea is, is setting targets as a sector um, that we can help achieve. Yeah, yeah, great. So transitioning from that uh, political jargon to some cultural jargon. Yeah, <laughs> <basically>. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> More our language. Exactly. Um, great. Um, so I was wondering if, if you could share with us uh, perhaps some of the common occurrence challenges that you've witnessed as you've had, you know, conversations about sustainability with cultural organizations of different sizes. Like, are, are there some that come up regularly? Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it's interesting because there's there's the institutional level and then there's the personal level. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, yeah, I mean, the first question I always get, and this is the most common question I get is, you know, oh, Caitlin, I'd like to be more sustainable, but I don't know how and I don't know where to begin. And I'm just a conservator. Or I'm just a curator. And so I don't have any decision making power in my institution. So what do I do? Um, that's, that's all, that was actually my question as well. You know, when I wanted to be more sustainable as a conservator, but I felt completely powerless to do anything about it. Um, so I think that that's basically the brunt of the work that I do is trying to figure out ways that we can empower everyone who wants to do something to be able to do something. Um, that's what the key books are aimed at. That is what, uh, key futures is aimed at, but also of course the, on the institutional level. Um, and I think that, you know, what's really important for me is that people realize that they do have the capacity to make real big change, even if they are just a conservator um, or just a curator, which I don't think is just in any, in any way, shape or form. Um, in terms of kind of the bigger picture ideas, you know, the, the big topics of conversation always go back to art transportation, um, packaging and shipping, um, lighting, HVAC systems. And I think what's really interesting, and this is one of the places where I think that kind of creating more lines of communication within our sector, but on a global level can actually be really helpful. Because there are a lot of, uh, I, was, I was giving a presentation in Copenhagen at ICOM CC a couple of years ago. And someone came up to me afterwards and I was talking about, you know, more sustainable um, climate conditions and, and, you know, BISO and all of those, all of those things. And someone came up to me afterwards and she said, you know, Caitlin, we're already doing all the things that you suggested, not because we have to, but because we only have access to energy three hours a day. And she was at the National Museum in the Philippines. And she said, because, you know, we just don't have HVAC systems and we don't have energy to control it. We do passive solutions. We, we have all of these really sustainable ways of maintaining our, our collections. And I think that it's what's really interesting is that we need to start thinking about that. Um, you know, preventive conservation is a very hot topic right now. And this, these ideas of, of 
um, climate control or something that people are starting to question in some places. Like, is it necessary in terms of, you know, these collections maybe have already lasted for a thousand years without climate control. So are we maybe damaging them by putting in them in climate control when they're more used to this condition? And also, you know, that goes to different geographical locations. I mean, the original some of the original research for climate conditions was, you know, made in the 70s in the UK. And then that's being implemented in, you know, desert Australia. So it's, I think that just starting to question a little bit why we're doing what we're doing um, is kind of the first, the first step to tackling some of these bigger issue questions. So I got off on a little bit of a tangent there, but I do yeah. hope that it, <laughs> that it uh, answered your, your question. Sorry your, for that. <laughs> your tangents are always welcome here. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I will, um, let's see, just, just a couple more questions here because uh, we have so many great comments and actually um, some really interesting uh, different programs being shared in, in the chat as well, which is always great. Um, but here's one uh, that all of these these fields um, that we've been uh, discussing over the past hour, um, you know, environmental sustainability and decolonization, repatriation, inclusiveness, um, that these are complex and often calling for legal or engineering, uh, human sciences knowledge. And uh, the question is, um, is this a question of ethics for us as museums professionals uh, to search for external expertise here? Um, that way we can provide our communities a, co a complete experience with strong scientific and academic knowledge on those complex topics. So basically, um, uh, not only the place for open dialogue in the museum, but also relying on the experts to not oversimplify any of these topics. Oh, that's a fabulous question. Um, I mean, yeah, I think I think that this goes back to the idea of partnerships and expertise. And you know, we don't have to have all the answers ourselves. Um, but it's imperative that we bring in the experts who do know the answers, you know, we, we need to make sure that we are obviously communicating information that's correct. Um, so you know, when we're talking about exhibitions on climate change, we're not necessarily creating it ourselves if we're not experts on climate change. Um, and I, I do think that that is an ethical aspect is, is to bring in, um, is to, you know, form the partnerships with people who can give us the right information. Um, and, you know, I, and that's, that goes back to what I said earlier about like, we're not alone in this. And this is not something we have to do by ourselves. I think it's imperative that we work together and outside the sector and with, um, with people who, you know, can, can give us the reliable information that we can transmit to our communities. Um, you know, that's, that's one of the benefits of being a museum is that people trust us. So when you walk into a museum, you don't question whether or not that's a Rembrandt on the, on the wall, <laughs> you just take, you know, it says it is, so it is. And that's the opportunity that we have because people do trust us. We are, you know, inherently trusted centers of learning and knowledge. So when people walk in, they know that what they're reading is going to be a fact. It's not politicized. It's not fake news. It's not agenda prone. It's real. And that's why we have such great power. And of course, with great power comes great responsibility. So we do have to do this in a way that is, uh... <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but oh, we have to throw it in, throw in that right. quote. Yeah. We're just going to throw it in there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, I think that I think that's essential. Absolutely. Absolutely. And a really, really excellent question. Great. Yeah, no, uh, it's it's important to have that trust. And it's definitely important to know that we can lean on each other. Like you said, we're, we're not alone in this. Yeah, um, exactly. So uh, before we wrap up, um, I, I would ask you to um, do a bit of uh, technical finagling because uh, we have someone who would like to see the resources slide once more, if oh, you wouldn't mind sharing yeah. that. Absolutely. And I can actually also, I'm happy to, I don't know if there's a way to do this, but I'm very happy to share this with anyone who wants it. Um, you can always email me info at keyculture.com and I'd be very happy to share any of this with everybody. Great. And that's also actually probably going to be somewhat of a similar answer to uh, the next question in here that um, will be the last question is we have someone wondering how they can work with you. Oh, that's so great. Well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we always welcome everyone who wants to join the join the team. Um, yeah, just send send me an email info at keyculture.com. I'll go to the next one. It's right there. Um, and uh, yeah, 
I love to love to bring anyone on board who's who wants to help out. You know, we've got a phenomenal team. We've got over 40 volunteers from all over the world, um, from Hong Kong to Rwanda to Brazil to Canada, and um, always looking to build more and build the uh, yeah, build the force. And yes, so thank you. I'm really excited. Looking forward to meeting you. <laughs> That's great. And uh, yeah, I, I will just say thank you once more, Caitlin. Uh, thank you so much for um, diving into this massive and massively important topic. Uh, it's always a pleasure to um, to chat with you and hear from, from your wealth of knowledge on this. So thank you so much. Oh, um, absolutely. My pleasure. And thank you so much for inviting me. It was really wonderful to get to, uh, to, get to share this with everyone and of course to get to talk with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much. All right, so um, yeah, with, uh, with that, we will go ahead and end our afternoon session. Um, that doesn't mean, of course, uh, that we're completely finished here. We have one more day uh, full of fun conference activities. Um, first of all, tomorrow morning, uh, 9.50 is the entry time, starting as always on time at 10 Central European time will be our COVID discussion session. Um, unfortunately, this, or fortunately, uh, this session is already fully booked. Um, but uh, following our COVID session, we do have a webinar, which if you have not already registered to this, um, the link will be posted in the chat. So you can still join us for this at 11.30 tomorrow. And that is the, um, uh, that will also be followed by our European Museum Cooperation Platform, which will be some more presentations from some of our project partners. So, um, yeah. Uh, oh, and of course, how could I forget? Uh, we do have a social session followed um, in the evening uh, where you can join myself and our communications officer, Rebecca, um, for a pub quiz and a bit of networking roulette. And this will be our more casual session. So it's going to be mics on, cameras on. We want to see your smiling faces. So uh, we hope you will join us for that tomorrow. And yeah, with that, I wish you all a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thank you again. Thank you. <laughs>